<laughs> Good morning. Uh, we're, we're fortunate today to have Professor Sierra Mers uh, to give us a lecture on, on uh, fitness, uh, on uh, agricultural estimation, uh, and on ADRC. Uh, Professor uh, Sierra uh, Mers come all the way from Mexico, and uh, he will uh, spend uh, the whole semester with us here. So this is uh, extremely uh, valuable uh, opportunity for us to have a deep conversation with Professor Sierra Mars. And uh, so this will be lecture number one, and we'll continue to have this at this time slot at this location for the next uh, three months, four months. Yep. And uh, so here you are. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Gao. I'm really delighted to be here. This is like finally a, a dream come true, <laughs> to be in touch with uh, the leading person in ADRC for many, many years in, in the U.S., China, and all over the world. Uh, it's a privilege to be here and to be uh, interacting with uh, brilliant students that uh, accompany him in this endeavor. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give a brief introduction to some of the things I've been doing in the, in the past uh, and how I finally landed after many different routes were taken in the area of ADRC, which sort of summarized many of the things I had been done in, in a more clear a uh, clear-cut way so that uh, everything I was pursuing was clearly explained already by ADRC. And uh, to cast it into the framework of differential flatness, algebraic identification, and some of the techniques of sliding mode control, uh, it was sort of then very natural to, to explain that the idea of ADRC was underlying all these techniques in a very uh, efficient manner. So, um, if, if anything I have been doing lately is trying to control nonlinear systems using linear controllers. But not just for local stabilization, but for trajectory tracking and moving far away from where the linearized model is valid. And, uh, and it turns out that flatness and ADRC allow you to do that in a very simple manner. So that um, at the end, many, many of the things that people uh, are, are really uh, trying hard to develop uh, can be vastly simplified in this arena with a simple view that that is very efficient and it's solutions oriented in engineering. Um, I was I was doing for some time sliding mode control. This this was my my basic um, area of research. What I did there was basically to to call the differential geometry. Uh, formulation into sliding mode control, which uh, had been developed in the Soviet Union at the beginning of, or at the middle of, of the 20th century. But many of the works made in the Soviet Union at that time were not really known in the West. And uh, the work of some pioneers like uh, Emelianov, or Utkin, which, who was one of his students, Vadim Utkin, uh, Professor Emelianov, and, uh, and many others, Professor Itkis. Uh, they, were, they were not very well known in the West until in the 70s and 80s, uh, they started to, to uh, show up in the literature, and uh, rapidly people like, uh, like Sastri, and uh, Slotin developed that into, um, into a technique that could be easily 
use for controlling robots to a certain extent with some limitations because of the discontinuity phenomena were affecting very much the performance of the controlled robot, uh, which was the main example at the time in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, iconic example of nonlinear systems that needed to be controlled in an efficient manner. So, um, sliding mode control was an arena that I found in the stage of development of, of nonlinear differential equations. When you, when you bring it up to the differential geometric formulation that was uh, arising at the time from the work of, of Krenner and Isidori and many others, uh, then, then everything became a little bit more transparent in the area of, of formulation, for formulating problems in sliding mode control with, uh, with some elegance put to the to the maps that you needed to consider in order to obtain ideal sliding dynamics and so on in terms of projection operators. So that was, that was exciting because at that moment there was little that was known in the area of application of differential geometry to discontinuous control. And then in a visit that I paid to Michel Fleece, who was very much interested in sliding mode control, uh, we started uh, learning uh, algebraic methods. Algebraic methods in, in nonlinear control. In general, linear or nonlinear control. And those algebraic methods were very interesting in the sense that they were very powerful. It was um, a different description of, of nonlinear systems uh, as related to the traditional first order nonlinear differential equation set. Uh, algebraic methods are, are far more general and, and the, the, the focus is, uh, is on differential fields and differential field extensions to describe nonlinear systems. And from the properties of those extensions, things like the the non-differential um, uh, transcendence degree and some other basic uh, issues in, in differential algebra, then you can exploit a lot of properties. And, and one of the main results that comes out from there is flatness. And this flatness is, is, uh, became my, my uh, area of, of work for many, many years in association with, with Michel. So, um, uh, f uh, flatness is, is a system property which is very useful and I, I hope to convey to you in, in, in a series of uh, small talks uh, that that importance is, is uh, very much geared towards design rather than description. So uh, flatness is applied to linear and nonlinear and even partial differential equations is, is a very natural technique. The theoretical basis for flatness is differential algebra. I might give you a, a, a small introduction to that, but um, that theory, which is complicated enough because it's based on, on algebraic geometry and, and differential algebraic geometry, uh, it is not necessary to understand flatness and to use it for, for designing for designing systems, systems and control systems. So um, this was my second area of of of, uh, of work. Of course, we we use module theory to to cast everything that was known in in sliding mode control using using module theory, and we call them sliding modules, in a paper that I wrote uh, with this many years ago. What we do there is, uh, uh, in linear systems, when you, when you see a system, it can be, it can be uh, considered to be a module. Uh, a module is an algebraic object in which the, you, you take elements like in a vector field, but uh, you multiply them by elements of a ring. 
And the elements of a ring is just polynomial differen differentiators. So uh, a, a system is naturally a module. And when you englobe this, this module theory into slide mode control, it comes out that all the basic elements of slide mode control can be easily described by means of modules and sub-modules and so on. And uh, from there it's transparent that uh, the robustness of sliding mode control is very much associated with a certain matching condition that, uh, that plays a crucial role because it's in generically speaking difficult to, to obtain this matching condition in any respect. But uh, when you generalize this a little bit, and this is one of the advantages of ADRC, when you can push all this, all this lack of, 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 uh, uh, of matching properties into a set of equations, and you push it down to the, to the last uh, differential equation describing your system, which is uh, supposed to be flat, then, then ADRC naturally solves the problem irrespectively of the nature of that disturbance affecting channels which are not matched to the, um, to the, uh, to the control input field. So um, algebraic methods were very useful in, in, for me at least, in understanding a little bit more deeper sliding mode control and the association with flatness to simplify systems design in terms of uh, vastly nonlinear systems by means of linear models, which some of them were exact, some of them were approximate. So uh, from there, I moved uh, within this area to, to algebraic identification. It was natural for us uh, to jump uh, to jump to this area because uh, there was a need to to know and qualify parameters in terms of, of trajectories how to compute them online and uh, it turned out that uh, the, the the theory of of modules together with uh, some non commutative algebra allowed us to solve completely the problem of algebraic identification in the presence of, of uh, structure disturbances. So that was, uh, that was uh, another big step in my, in my work in which we devoted a lot of energy to, to algebraic identification methods and um, to obtain online estimates of, of states uh, fast, quickly, and uh, based on the model, and also to obtain uh, a sufficient number of time derivatives of uh, arbitrary signals in order to, to do compensation or to do feedback or to, uh, to obtain uh, some, some needed uh, differentiations. So all, this, all these things pertain to things which are, which are very much in use in the area of ADRC and, and systems and nonlinear systems in general. And uh, we devoted a lot of energy to this, produced a book in this area, also one in this area, and one in flatness and, um, and one in study mode control. Uh, with the experience of the students and, and with showing experiments and so on, on how this thing worked. And then, uh, and then uh, we did something called GPI control, as, a, as an outgrowth of of our method, GPI control was was uh, basically for linear systems. It was a way to 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 control linear systems without using observers, but uh, using what uh, we name integral reconstructors. And uh, you can show that um, using integral reconstructors, you can actually control a linear system very efficiently, whether it's monovariable or multivariable, uh, whether it's continuous time or discrete time. You can, you can do this uh, in terms of inputs and outputs only. So by, by measuring inputs and outputs, you can, you can be um, 
you can be very efficient in controlling the system and the controller turns out to be linear. And uh, at that time, we devoted some energy to, to try to extend that GPI control to nonlinear systems. And uh, when I was doing that, uh, the area of, of nonlinear systems, then I, uh, I had come up with what we call GPI observers. Uh, this was independently of what was already known in, in ADRC. I was developing this and, and finding out that you could actually estimate disturbances which, which were state dependent with these uh, extended observers. They are generalized proportional integral observers. That means you, you extend the observer a number of, of degrees of freedom and then you can get derivatives of signals, the, the first and the second and the third and so on. And I was using that information to control, to do feedback control of linear and then very timidly started to do control of nonlinear systems. And I found that, uh, that this worked pretty well in the sense that uh, you were able to estimate the disturbance very accurately and then eliminate it from, from your input-output dynamics and obtain a, a closed loop which was uh, uh, asymptotically stable in the tracking error or the stabilization error term. So we had, um, we were very excited about this and, um, and I started talking about GPI controllers and GPI observers of nonlinear systems. It turned out we could, we could sweep the, under the carpet all the nonlinearities that were not interested and flatness provided the scheme that made this, this thing very easy to, to implement and very easy to, to, uh, to carry out the science with. So uh, at that point I, I, I found out that uh, the idea, although it was not exactly the same, it had been developed by, by Professor Han and Professor Gao in, in several papers. So um, GPI observers uh, had uh, uh, a, a large extension over the original observer and so it was able to compute more derivatives of the, of the output. But uh, it was not really necessary to have those long extensions and since uh, ADRC already provided uh, very nice solutions with just one single extension, so I, I started to, to do ADRC with a proper name in, by, by bringing all this experience of GPI control that I had at the moment in controlling nonlinear systems and doing it in the manner of ADRC. And of course, uh, the idea of flatness was very much in there. And, uh, and uh, we also did something about using uh, the marriage of algebraic identification in order to obtain estimates of the gains of these nonlinear systems when these gains were not known. Uh, that was a, an interesting issue that, uh, that needed a very fast identification procedure to be able to implement this. And you will see in, the, in the, my old slides that that's the way we use algebraic identification in, in connection with ADRC just to estimate the gain of the, of the system. And um, okay, and from there, uh, gaining some insight from the area of GPI control and flatness, it was uh, for me natural to to identify uh, things like sliding mode control from, from the input-output viewpoint, um, GPI control, and, um, and of course, uh, what else is in there? Uh, uh, as, as a particular case, let's say PI, PI control or PID, PI, PI square, so on, control, and PID control naturally. Um, 
to identify those things uh, in a single a single framework, uh, we were able to show that for the, for the in the context of flat systems. Uh, sliding mode control, GPI control, and observer-based disturbance observer-based control. All of them were equivalent. They're not different. They're the same thing. And uh, and. Um, and that's when, um, when uh, we realized that, um, that we could break up the, the design of, of any controller of this sort in, in something which, in terms of something which was uh, very easy to, to accomplish. Our ADRC experience showed us that it was very easy to tune the observer and the controller to get uh, an excellent performance, and the observer needed to be somewhat high gain, and the controller moderate high gain, and uh, the combination of those two for nonlinear systems allowed us to control very efficiently things like pendula, inverted pendula, triple inverted pendula, and many other mechanical systems, which uh, which are very useful in in in, in teaching and also in, in some industries. So um, this is the point uh, where things are, are, are resting at this moment in my area, uh, in my research. All these things being equivalent gives us, a, and being exactly the same thing, because you can jump from one kind of design to the other, modifying almost nothing except the definition of some variables. Uh, this already shows you that ADRC is at the basis of of probably the, 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 the most important uh, control techniques that are, being, that are being advertised today in the literature uh, as robust techniques for, for controlling nonlinear systems. All of them are completely equivalent to ADRC. Completely equivalent, I mean literally equivalent. There is no, no buts or, or, or particular cases. Of course, in the context of, of flat systems, which is a large class of nonlinear systems. And um, so, um, in this context, uh, what uh, we will be probably talking about in these lectures is a brief introduction to flatness. It's required before we do some algebraic identification. And, uh, and then we'll jump from there to what we have been doing in ADRC. And, um, and that, that would be, uh, I mean, that would fill up some time in, in these in this, uh, meetings. And the idea is that, that we can interact about all these things and not just me lecturing or saying things that might not be relevant or true but uh, to be able to, to interact and get some criticism and get some new directions that we could continue to explore uh, in this uh, orbit of techniques that are surrounding ADRC in a way that was not made explicit before. Um, that, that type of, of unification for me is, is very appealing because it it tells me that uh, somehow what I was doing was uh, irrevocably leading me to ADRC. And, uh, and uh, I've enjoyed the ride so far very much. Okay, uh, questions or yeah, clarifications? We can uh, have a few minutes of discussion. This is very, very good uh, <laughs> over, uh, overview of your research for the last okay. decades. Yeah. <coughs> so let me, let me, um, uh, you mentioned the sliding mode control in the input-output perspective. Sliding mode control, what do you mean by that? Has that been, um, 
proposed in the state space. Uh, uh, most of the techniques are explained in state space. Yeah. So, 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 so now uh, uh, you, you take a, a static mode that you put it in the input output relation. Right? So yeah. Uh, slightly mode control is is has been m married. Hello, how are you? Nice to see you. Uh, slightly mode control has been uh, married to the state space representation ever since the 1950s. That was one of the Russian achievements. And um, but if you read. Uh, if you read books like uh, the one written by Professor Sipkin, uh, I think it's Sipkin, um, you find uh, you find his dissatisfaction with this fact that uh, you need that you need the state space, the full state space, in order to be able to talk about sliding mode control in a geometric context. Um, and uh, and uh, I had the same feeling for 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 a long, long time. That uh, why can we not use the input-output approach to define sliding mode control? I mean, the people who had tried that it immediately told, tell you that, um, that the input-output approach is very limited and the state space approach was a generalization very useful that allowed computers to come in and and solve real problems and then the problem was the state estimation and Kalman did everything that was needed to be done about it and um, and state space became uh, you know uh, a part of our daily life and uh, for some time we forgot the benefits of of uh, the frequency domain um, approach until it was resurrected uh, by starting with pioneering work by by Athens and then by many of the people who worked in H infinity and so on as a generalization they tried to to uh, see the benefits of uh, of the input output approach in in defining robustness and, and dealing with uh, systems design in the practical arena and facing uncertainty and facing uh, disturbances which belong to families of, of disturbances difficult to to handle one by one and H infinity pertained to to handle all these uh, nonlinear all these uh, disturbances in a manner which which faces the entire family of, of disturbances Excuse whether they are the input or yeah, uh, the state space uh, uh, was adopted by uh, Kalman, 1960. Yeah, it, it was brought up by Kalman when, when he when he uh, so, he went into Lyapunov theory for stability. Right. But the, the steady mode control is uh, you said in 19, middle of 19. Yeah, but the Russians were ever since Lyapunov, right. the state space was was uh, known to the Russians. But nobody used it for control, for uh, f for linear control systems. But it was used for non-linear control systems. So that was before yeah, yeah, before Kalman. Well, Lyapunov formulated his problems in the state space. Right, but uh, linear for linear system, A B C D matrices. No, no, that the, model the, had been uh, th that that model was conceived by Kalman. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the study mode the control prior to that. Was conducting state space, but not in ABC. But in a no, in nonlinear. Non well, for nonlinear systems, yeah. Right. But, but uh, yeah, it, it was very difficult, especially for the multivariable case. It was very difficult to right. Right. to obtain a clear cut solution of. of yeah. uh, and uh, and uh, uh, your your uh, trend in the 70s uh, with the linear space space uh, approach. Yeah. Uh, now you imagine at MIT, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so, so the common for ABCD. Yeah, we could have GH so how, there. How did you get connected to the starting mode control? Uh, okay, and, and start your almost entire career from there. Yeah, um, I, 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 uh, I wasn't doing this for my PhD. I was doing something completely different. I was doing. Um, uh, uh, 
set theoretic uh, estimation of states and which became, nowadays is known as ellipsoidal calculus. <laughs> but uh, in those days, uh, professor uh, called it a non but bounded uh, estimation of, estimation and control of, of linear systems, basically. We were not doing non-linear systems. And I, I got my PhD on the, on the Fred Schweppe doing that type of, of, of things for, for systems with uncertainties which were not describable by stochastic processes, but, but by sets like polyhedrons, ellipsoids, and things like that. And um, so I, I, I was fed up with, with a non but bounded for <laughs> after getting my PhD. And uh, one day I attended a conference of Vadim Utkin in, in Urbana Champagne. There was one of these Allerton conferences. Uh, I met Professor Utkin there. I, I was impressed by the fact that uh, in his nice style of exposition, uh, you know, nonlinear systems could be easily controlled using slide mode control. So, uh, since uh, at that time the differential geometric uh, methods were being put out, I immediately grabbed this and, and applied it to this. And uh, then everything became clear for me that, uh, that, uh, differential, that this area of mathematics had a lot to do with, with simplifying the view of sliding mode control. And, um, and then Michel Fleece appeared in some papers talking about uh, differential algebra applied to nonlinear systems. I wanted to study that because I, I thought that that was the proper, the proper uh, framework for sliding mode. And, um, and that's how I got invited by Michel and, and we started working on that. We did it for linear system basically, but, but then everything uh, uh, started from there. So, um, yes, uh, Yes, a sliding mode control has been needlessly uh, married to the state space formulation, and uh, I pursued this for, 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 for many, many years until I finally found that uh, using the input-output approach and, and flatness, uh, you could synthesize everything in terms of transfer function. So, so sliding mode control, whatever scheme you have of sliding mode control of a nonlinear system can be thought of as a, as a classical controller design uh, applied on a simplified version of the system with extra disturbances and uh, ADRC being at the, at the heart of the, of the loop design in a very efficient manner and then, and then naturally the implementation of sliding mode control comes through something that I had already developed uh, some years before called delta modulation. Delta modulation uh, in control um, or sigma delta modulation is, is a tool that allows you to implement this continuous control in terms of continuous designs and uh, uh, th this, this area I knew from communication theory. It was very popular in the 50s to use sigma delta modulation, modulators to encode voice and transmit voice in terms of bits. And uh, sigma delta modulation uh, is a very simple nonlinear uh, scheme with a feedback and integration that allows you to do an analog to digital conversion. Basically, it's analog to digital conversion. Uh, but for control systems, this analog digital is, is more pro properly called analog, analog binary uh, conversion. And, uh, and that, that was uh, the key element that naturally arises in a sliding mode control scheme when you manipulate algebraically the equations of the system and, and all, all the definitions of the sliding surface and so on, out comes naturally without doing anything, out comes an uh, analog to binary conversion scheme applied to a continuous design. So any sliding mode control scheme place in the state space 
can be thought of as a classical compensation scheme implemented by means of analog binary converter called the sigma delta modulator. So, and in that classical scheme, the ADRC controller, because it has this relation with, with all these very well-known techniques, is very natural to use it uh, for, for controlling uh, a nonlinear system, given that the, the disturbances uh, can englobe not only unknown signals affecting the system externally, but also uh, nonlinearities. Nonlinearities that are that are just clogging your 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 design, and which can be get rid of by means of estimation and cancellation. And uh, this is what GPI observers did, and this is what IDRC controller does. So, um, what about the chattering in the stacking mode control? Oh, it's always it's always present. I mean, uh, the the thing is. A, a sliding mode control was wrongfully being applied to, to mechanical systems. Uh, that's an area in which you don't want to you don't want to use a sliding mode controller because unless you want to overheat your motors and so on, uh, sliding mode control, being a discontinuous control technique, is is more natural for power electronics and things like that. But your GPI and also the surface-based control who not necessarily chatter. Oh, no, no, because they are continuous. I mean, you have a continuous control input. Right. But in power electronics, you don't have an actuator. What you have is a switch. This is your control. Right. So you have this continuity whether you want it or not. You say they're equivalent in, in some sense. Yeah. Right? And, and, and uh, so, so you are... Uh, uh, yeah, here's your controller, here's your perturbation, here's your plant, here's your output. Okay? This plant might be the simplification of a nonlinear plant. Uh, monovariable or multiple, I suppose it's monovariable. And uh, so this is this is a scheme in which you can use an ADRC controller here, no problem. Right? Now, you say, my control is not of this sort. My control is not a, a smooth voltage that is going up and down. My control is a switch. If my control is a switch which has only two positions, one or zero, this design, how to implement this design? Because you, you need 0 0.4, 0 0.5 volts, and it gives you zero or one volt. So, you have to switch. And, and what you do, what you do is, you do your design, and this is, this is how the equivalence, this is how the equivalence comes out. Uh, you have uh, this perturbation, you synthesize, uh, you synthesize your control, you put a sigma delta modulator here, here is your plant accepting zeros and ones, and um, So if you have a if you have a discontinuous system in which your control is a switch, uh, then what you do is you forget that you have that switch and you do this design. You do this design and now you implement it like this. But this design is ADRC. If you want. That's, that's why they are equivalent. And this is not artificially imposed. This comes out naturally of wanting to control this by, me, by means of a sliding mode control when they tell you, U is not a continuous signal. U is a binary valued signal. When somebody imposes this restriction to you after you have done the design, you have to go to sliding mode control. Because this design is not directly applicable, it turns out that if you you forget about this, you forget about this and do the sliding mode control, and now start manipulating the sliding mode control equations, you end up with this. Naturally, these things emerges naturally from the design of sliding mode control. 
And it has so many advantages because the, the sliding motions are taking place in the one-dimensional state space of this nonlinear circuit. So you, you take a sliding mode control from the state space of the system and you trade that by a one-dimensional sliding motion in the state space of your implementer. That's, that's the big advantage. What about the other case? The other case, uh, I think most of the uh, uh, other controls, uh, your, your, your control signal is continuous. So it's, like you say, you don't want... Yeah, you don't want to, to switch them. Well, if you do use sliding mode control, you end up with a discontinuous... Uh, so, so, so yeah, but then... Right? <laughs> so so how, 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 how do you uh, see the equivalence in that case? It's, it's the same, only that... Only that my, my philosophical position with respect to sliding mode control after having spent many, many years working on it is sliding mode control is fantastic, but it's not good for mechanical systems or, or processes. Uh, that's not the, the proper thing because your actuator doesn't take that, that amount of discontinuities and bang, bang control for a very long, long time. You will damage your actuator, you will damage your motors by submitting them to this bang-bang type of, of, of thing. So it's more natural uh, for areas like power electronics, communication systems, algorithms. You know, algorithms can be seen as, as dynamical systems. And usually decision variables there uh, are finitely valued. And, uh, and, and so you take either one decision or the other, that's, that's, that's practically a switch. And sliding mode control should contribute something in the theory of, of algorithms for treating them as controlled dynamical systems that need to be hurried up to obtain convergence. Things of that sort can be easily, easily translated. But if you have a, a, a nice mechanical system in which you have 20 kilowatt plant, you're not going to switch your, your, your steam power around. Yeah, it's, uh, it, be, it becomes a nuisance and, and a problem. And you can damage the entire system by doing that. So, uh, of course, people use slide mode control for robotics and many other things. Uh, first of all, mistakenly thinking that this is a robust technique. It is robust under very stringent conditions which are the matching conditions. If you don't satisfy matching conditions, which is a geometric, uh, a geometric, um, a geometric uh, problem of, of bringing your, your, your input vector field exactly aligned with the disturbance field. If the system doesn't have that property, forget it. You're not going to be robust with respect to those disturbances which are misaligned with the control input field. And that's very easy to show. And um, th therefore, f first mistake, to think that sliding mode control is robust, per definition. It is to a certain extent, but within some very stringent geometric condition that has to be satisfied exactly. If you don't have that, you will have all this chattering, you will have all this problem. Chattering is unavoidable in slide mode control. You, you, can, you can smooth it out, and this is what people have tried. I mean, instead of having a zero or a one, uh, instead of having zeros or one, let's, let's put something smooth. But that, that's, uh, that, that destroys slide mode. Uh, that well, makes the slide mode non-robust. So if, if the equivalency you establish there can be uh, used to address an issue, then maybe we could say that in those areas uh, where you have a continuous uh, 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 control signal, uh, the, the property of sliding mode control, the nice property of sliding mode can be, can be obtained by using uh, a disturbance-based control, disturbance-observer-based control, without the shutter. So, so <coughs> oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I mean, but that's an implication of your uh, equivalency. Right? Yeah, yeah. Th th this is this is totally equivalent to to ADRC, and on the average, on the average, on the average, right. is equivalent to sliding mode control.
So on, on the average, we can eliminate the, uh, the, uh, the, the chattering of the uh, Yeah, but on the average, it's just, uh, it's just an idealization. It's, it's just an idealization. You're, you're substituting something which is discontinuous, you see, banging on and off by something which, which is, on the average, uh, called equivalent control. So your actual control is zeros and ones, and your, your uh, average controller is, is smooth, or sufficiently smooth, but, but that, cannot be, that cannot be overcome when this is the case. So, so let me clarify. Uh, so, so what you are saying is uh, you can obtain the, uh, the property of sliding mode control without chattering by implementing it in GPI or in ADRC framework. That something yes, but, but, but for systems whose actuator is, is continuous. Right. But if, I'm, if, I'm, if, I'm, if your actuator is discontinuous. Right, right. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm talking about a system with a continuous actuator. Oh, yeah. Would that be something that uh, a natural, natural outcome of your... Oh, yeah, because it's, because it's this. I mean, if, if your actuator is continuous, you don't need this and you have this. So, so if, if that's true, then the, uh, for the continuous uh, uh, actuator uh, uh, plant, the chattering or sliding mode is removed? No, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that because chattering is only yeah. pertaining to switch systems. Chattering... But, but, but if you apply the sliding mode control to a continuous uh, actuator, your outcome, the sliding mode control give you on and off. Oh yeah, but destroys the actuator. Right. So, so that's what I'm saying. You, know, you, you, you are saying uh, uh, with, with this equivalency, you are saying the same property can be obtained in GPI, in uh, deserving of blur or base control. They're equivalent, right? That, that's what your... Uh, well, they're equivalent right. within, this, within this limitation. This is the equivalent. So are you saying that only equivalent when you have discontinuous uh, control signal? Yeah, because you don't use these continuous control signals when your, your actuator is not switched. Right. All right. If if you have if you have a a, a drive that is driving your your motor in a continuous fashion, yeah. why do you want to put it uh, this continuous? So, so uh, that's what I'm trying to clarify. This equivalency uh, has uh, a presumption. The presumption is your input is discontinuous. My input is discontinuous. Discontinuous. And if my input is discontinuous. Uh, I would like to implement this, uh -huh. and it turns out that you can because the, the manipulating the sliding mode control equations, you get this. So, so this discussion wouldn't make any sense if the input is continuous. Yeah, it wouldn't make any sense. Right. You, uh, from, my, from my point of view, when your input is continuous, you don't need this. Okay. I mean, it's, it's out of the question. It's like saying... But, but, but people do apply sliding mode control. Oh, yes. Right? And the premises I was trying to explain is on the two premises, which are, which are false. The first premise is that this is a robust uh, control technique. Right. That's yes, that's it right. is robust if a geometric condition, which has to be exactly satisfied, right. is satisfied. If that is not true, then you... A DC motor. Well, let me put you the... Wait, we understand that. Yeah. Yeah. What's the second one? What's the, what, what's the second uh, presumption? The second one. I have a continuous, the second presumption, I have a continuous controller, I have a nice continuous actuator, and I want to, to give discontinuities to the plant. Make no sense. That, that make, make, no makes sense. no sense. That's what people have been doing for years. <laughs> this is why I, I constrain my slide mode control things to, to things like this, power electronics, yeah. communication systems, Algorithms. That's, those are a few of the areas that I have been exploring. And the equivalency you establish is restricted to this case. To the state? To, to this case, to, to this discontinuous uh, control. Yeah, system. yeah. When you want to control these systems, yeah. what you do is you do this, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then you implement this. No, the same plant. The same plant. Mm -hmm. This is the plant to be controlled. Yes. The first the plant is can accept the continuous signal. The second plant. No, this is this continuous now. Zero one. Uh, he, he's saying both plants are having a discrete uh, input. I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you. I'll show you a simple example. 
Suppose you have. Suppose you have a converter. This is a DC to DC power converter. Your, your control is a switch. You either charge the, the inductor or you discharge it through the capacitor. So all the energy stored here goes over there and you will, you will be able to regulate the voltage here uh, to a fraction of this, of this. There are others that do the amplification. This is called the back converter. Back converter. So this continuous system, no matter what. So uh, you have uh, your, your model for... Mm. It's something like this. And um, P over R. Okay. This is a plant, and, and your control U cannot be other thing but zeros and ones. Mm. Uh, no matter what, I mean, you, your control is zeros and ones. Mm. So you, you're bound to chattering. <laughs> you cannot avoid it, because uh, you will go from one level of energy to the next by switching, and, and therefore you introduce these continuities with U equals zeros and ones. So if I had something like that, and I know this, I would say, how do I design a controller which is efficient and that uses all this nice theory of ADRC and so on? It's a second order system. The first thing to do is to, to forget that I, have, that I have a discontinuous control signal, and I assume it is continuous. So now it's a linear system with a continuous controller. I can do this immediately with the IDRC or whatever, all right? And I would say, okay, now, what good is it for me? I mean, how do I, I implement this, 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 this controller? Well, the way to implement is to put this. And that is completely equivalent to saying, I will try to create a sliding mode controller in the state space x1, x2, with a surface that gives me stability to the origin. And I can design the surface and do everything I, I need to do there and, and do the extensions and, and come up with the closed loop equations. I will obtain, if I, if I modify those equations legally, I will obtain something like this. So my design was useful because I could use it because it was not divorced from, from what I had there. But now I can, I, I can implement my continuous design which is very simple uh, in terms of in terms of uh, a classical controller with a sigma delta modulator. Right. So this is where sliding mode control has to be used. So, so but you accept in in this case the C can be designed in three different methods, but they are equivalent. Yeah, they produce the same input-output relationship. This is the sense of equivalence. They produce the same input relation.
Okay, so um, we've come to the point in which I want to ask you what would you like to see? Uh, we will go through everything, but the, the order is probably important. Uh, I believe flatness is, is basic too, and GPI control after that. And algebraic estimation is, is, is an outcome that, that was very useful for estimating parameters and computing derivatives of signals and so on. But in my way of, of seeing things nowadays after so many years is, no, uh, ADRC does, does all that much better. So uh, there's no need for that. You mean the, the computationally or the implementation wise? Uh, uh, I mean, you can forget but, about, but the, uh, about on parameters. The, on the theoretical side, but this, this has a much longer history of uh, yeah. universe yeah. establishment. Yeah. Of, of, uh, of the, you, you, you start with a uh, differential algebra. Uh, ADRT didn't start with yeah. <laughs> that, that kind of. Yeah, so, it, so, it so can be placed in that context. Right. So, so you, you started with the differential. Different algebra, then you establish flatness, mm -hmm. right? And uh, GPI is, out, uh, uh, is a, a outcome of uh, uh, flatness, right? It's a, it derived out of uh, yeah. flatness. Yeah. So everything goes from there. So, so maybe the maybe flatness will be a good, good starting point, yeah. right? And uh, but we need to study uh, differential algebra. I can give you an introduction to differential algebra. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but we, but but you, the, 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 what I have found out in this in this area of, of differential algebra is the theory is, is beautiful. The theory is mesmerizing. Right. The theory is, <laughs> I mean, it, it really puts your spirit very high, but it's not necessary uh -huh. <laughs> because it's very difficult. But but we can try. I mean, you can try to see uh, how it goes. But then. Th the, the practical imp implications of all these theoretical results is very easy to understand in terms of concrete examples. You just grasp it very simply without, without you know, thinking about differential fields and differential field extensions and uh, you know, transcendence degree and differential transcendence degree and the primitive element theorem and so on and ideas which which are perfect because the radical idea coincides with the idea and so on. Uh, all, all these ideas in differential, geo differential algebra and, and, and algebraic geometry uh, are tools of every day, but they are more pertaining to a mathematician who wants, who wants to, to find out um, you know, the solution of a set of common series of a bunch of polynomials. And in this area, it's just differential polynomials, polynomials that include derivatives. And you want to, uh, your system equation is one, one of those differential polynomials equated to zero. And m many of them, uh, I'll give you just an example to tell you what I'm talking about. Suppose you have a, a simple oscillator, it's a pendulum, right? with some frequency and so on, and why is the angular deviation. Of course, th this is a differential equation which is non-linear because it has this term here. But, um, but uh, suppose I, I multiply everything by y dot, all right, and uh, I take one more derivative. I take one more derivative, y3 is minus omega squared, y dot sine, so I, I write that cosine to the square and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put this um, uh, y dot y double dot uh, square minus y dot square equals zero. I think this is this is true. But let me see, I mean, y3 is just uh, minus omega square y dot sine of y and y dot y double dot is y dot sine of y. So if you if you raise this to the square, you'll have omega fourth maybe. Okay. This uh, square plus this square gives you omega 
fourth y dot square. Yeah. So this equation is a differential algebraic equation which is derived from this by very simple operations, right? You, you took, you raise that to the square, you multiply the original equation by y dot, you raise it to the square, add the, the, the results, you get this, right? You get this. So this is, this is the same system. It's exactly the same system and also, it's, it's, it's a system that uh, has certain peculiarities. This is a polynomial system. This is a transcendental system. You cannot do away with this sign except if you're willing to put an infinite series, right? Of course, an approximation can always be worked out for very small motions. But sine of y is a transcendental function that has, uh, is, is, uh, has an analytic representation in terms of a, of a series with infinite terms and infinite derivatives. But here you don't have that. You have an algebraic differential equation. And, uh, and now you take this differential equation, you, you raise it to the fifth power, take the original one, raise it to the third power, you add them or divide them, and, and you still have an equation, which is mo much more complicated. But it tells you that somehow this, this thing can generate an infinite number of differential equations of polynomial type in the variables y, y dot, and the, this finite number of derivatives. And this infinite collection of differential equations, which are representing exactly the same system, is called a field. And it's a field in which you can differentiate and you can add, multiply, divide. So it's a differential field. It's a field with an extra operation called differentiation. And uh, what would be the, the properties of that differential field, which is an extension over the reals, because omega is real. It's a field extension of, over the over the field of reals, and it has an element y which doesn't, which satisfies an algebraic differential equation. So th that, that, that field has, has one element, y, that is capable of generating the whole field by, by legal operations of addition, multiplication, uh, differentiation, and so on. The, the very, the, the, the very same operations that led me to, from this equation to this arbitrary operations that are not contradictory or which are not illegal. I'm not taking square roots of, or, or, or creating the possibilities of having multiple solutions. No, I'm just doing straightforward manipulation of those things with, with, uh, with the original equation and I get rid of the transcendence. And I, I substitute that by, a, by an equation which is algebraic, purely algebraic, in the variable y and its time derivatives. So with this framework, the properties of the field generated by y have a lot to say about the system. And this is what was done for, for control systems. Um, if you had something like this, now the situation is completely different because you, you're adding a new variable which was not in the original system. And that new variable has one property. This variable, which is an indeterminate, a new indeterminate, does not satisfy any differential equation. This variable does not satisfy any. So it is transcendence, is a transcendence element of the field that you can generate with the y's. So all, all this, like here you could do something similar, but, but then you would, have, you would have the following thing, which is, um, I mean, maybe it's a sine of y. So you have y dot cosine of y plus u dot. And uh, let's say, all right. And uh, so y3 minus u squared.
square plus um, y dot y dot minus y dot uh, u square minus omega 4 y dot equals to zero. So this is also a, a controlled system in which the u somehow, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the u now appears under the sign of differentiation. This is non-classical in, 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 in control. Control doesn't like to have derivatives of the control input. But you will not deny to me that, that this equation is exactly the same as this equation. This is a different representation of the same system. And, um, and um, all right. So this element that does not satisfy any differential equation is somehow given the possibilities of describing now algebraic differential equations in which the u does not necessarily come without a derivative term. So that's a generalization of what we know. We always avoid to having derivatives in the control. But you, you can use them to produce a new structure into the system. And this structure is a stru structure of a, of a field which is generated by differential polynomials in U. You extend that to y, and you do all the, the, the possible differentiations with y and y dot and y double dot and whatever, and you still have a system in which your control is, has an identity, has some personality which is preserved, and all the paraphernalia of the y's is being, is being uh, you know, taken into account by, by highly nonlinear polynomial differential equations. And that's uh, that's um, that's uh, the, the the key the key issue. When when you study general properties of these differential field extensions, then flatness comes as a natural consequence, and many other things aside from flatness also come out as a natural consequence of of this framework to analyze your nonlinear system. Uh, in an, in an entirely different way than, than has been traditionally done, using only differential equations. That's the realm of differential algebra. That's the application of differential algebra to the control field. And, uh, and uh, it's non-classical in that sense. You, you see, Kalman did not advocate the presence of control inputs which needed to be differentiated to describe, to describe the system. And in fact, when you do classical mechanics, uh, you will never obtain those differentiators. It's different when you do circuit theory. In circuit theory, you will have examples of circuits in which, in which the derivative appears. But, uh, but they are uh, a different class of system. So differential algebra somehow is at the very heart of explaining in vastly general terms, I mean, whatever equation you can generate legally from the original equation will be part of a vast structure called the differential field extension over the control inputs. And the properties of that f field extension are, are, are very, very crucial in deciding what the properties of the system is. Michel Fries was the only uh, mathematician that saw this possibility by like applying this to uh, controls. Yeah, he he was a pioneer in that, and uh, there was another guy by the name of Pomaret, but he was he was more interested into partial differential equations. Mm. So he was more interested in partial differential fields. But differential fields in and control, people like Fleece, people like Glad, were using these ideas. And, uh, and from, from all these developments, flatness came out as a natural property that was important because it, it sort of pertained to the, uh, to the, to the generating uh, an element that could generate the entire field. So starting with uh, Fleece, uh, this uh, uh, 
differential mathematics called differential algebra uh, was applied to control. Was applied to control, yeah. Kalman applied, uh, applied module theory, which is part of differential algebra also, but linear differential algebra, but in a different manner. He, he thought of modules as, as time modules, not as state space modules or, or uh, you know, indeterminate, modules of indeterminates. So, so Kalman was right about bringing modules into linear system theory, but he did it in the time structure. And it turns out that there's little you can do, I mean, there's not much you can do with that approach. But when you bring it to the state space or to the, to the indeterminates that define your system, when you bring the, the module theory there, then, then properties like you know controllability, observability become transparent. Right. So I remember module theory, module field ring. Yeah. Uh, these terms were used in, in linear system theory, but in the context of uh, yeah. uh, trend functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is different. Yeah, this is different. This is more in, in the terms of oh, because th there the ground field is the real the real uh, right. line or the complex line. Here, the ground field is a differential field on which you extend to obtain the nonlinear differential equations of alge algebraic or polynomial type. They can also be rational, no problem with rational differential equations. They, they can be englobed.